Hey, and welcome to Be The Bridge. I'm your host, Brian Payton Joyner. From the time I was 11, I tried to pray away the gay. But my senior year in college, I realized I could pray and be gay. Each week, I'll share my experiences and chat with others as we build a bridge between the LGBT community and people of faith. Thanks for joining, and let the construction begin. Hello, fellow bridge builders. Thank you all for joining me today for this special episode of Be The Bridge Podcast. Over the last six months, I've interviewed about 30 folks, and I'm excited to bring you some of your favorite episodes and mine. Part of this is replaying the prior episode, but then also going into detail on some of the topics that the speakers addressed where y'all have wanted more information. And I'm very excited today to have my great friend Robert Cottrell talk about inerrancy of the scriptures. Robert, welcome to the show. Hey, Brian. Isn't this a fun topic? Yes. (laughs) Everybody's favorite topic. This is great. (laughs) I'll start with looking at this by providing a little bit of a definition here. And this comes from my prior denomination, the Southern Baptist Convention, This is their view regarding the scriptures and its inerrancy. They say the Holy Bible was written by men, divinely inspired, and is God's revelation of himself to man. It is a perfect treasure of divine instruction. It has God for its author, salvation for its end, and truth without any mixture of error for its matter. Therefore, all scripture is totally true and trustworthy. For the most part, this was probably the view of the Bible through about the Middle Ages when people started to look at the scriptures and notice there were some big discrepancies. There was a revival in the Renaissance period where people began to restudy the classic languages, Greek, Hebrew, Aramaic, and start to see that the way that God is talked about is different. The language that's used in these verses is different. And they found that there were not only internal differences in different parts of the Bible, but then also later discrepancies between the Bible and science. Around the 1800s, as people started to develop more of the field of biblical criticism, and it wasn't criticism to the extent of I'm on fine flaws, but just as a way to help us better understand the Bible and how to interpret the Bible, you had people looking at the text and the context in which it was written and the audience to whom it was written at that time. And they had a fuller understanding, but then some folks didn't like that. And you had a rebirth of this doctrine of inerrancy in the 1800s, which many denominations have continued to uphold and believe to be absolutely true to this day. So let's talk about this doctrine of inerrancy. How do you see it used today in the mistreatment of the LGBTQI plus community. <laughs> that's a big jump there. And I, I, but that's a really important question because to me, how it's used or how it's abused is really the bottom line. We talked about this briefly before we got started here today, but the bottom line on all of this is that so you, you believe something, you have a theological belief or stance. Well, how does that lead you to treat another person? Uh, And like you said, the difference in this inerrancy view was that before the literal inerrancy of Scripture is that notion developed in in Protestantism as part of Reformed theology in the 19th century. Before that, it may have been considered without error, but it was taken oftentimes as, as poetry, analogy, not the literal inerrancy like they do today. The unfortunate part and this is certainly true of the LGBT community, but it's been true of um, many other communities in the past, women, um, blacks, um, things like that, uh, that this debate, this issue is often used to condemn someone. And it's used to condemn someone who's different in some way from the person using it. Right. And this is this always fascinates me because they, They don't use it to ask themselves why they're not giving a cup of cold water to someone who's thirsty, why they're not seeking justice, why they're not helping the poor, why they're not following the Beatitudes, things like that. They they focus on this, quote, literal inerrancy of the Bible 
to take these six scripture passages to condemn someone who's different from them. Uh, it's dangerous, and the, re- and the results have been absolutely tragic in broken relationships and suicides and homelessness and broken families, and it's, uh, it's a shame. It's very interesting to me as I've been reading through the first five books of the Hebrew Scripture. There's so much more in there about how we should be treating foreigners, widows, and orphans. <laughs> yeah. The Bible is full of references as to how we need to be treating the oppressed. And yet the way that the Bible is used is as a weapon against the oppressed. That's why to me the question is a little bit, you know, those that bring it up, I'm being presumptive for the most part, but 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 I believe a lot of people who bring up this issue have no desire to have a theological debate about the inerrancy of scripture. They're bringing it up to make a point. And like you said, and, and they don't apply the same view towards scripture to all these other areas of life. Again, the poor, the immigrants, the oppressed, but they tend to want to stick to the literal inerrancy of the Bible on these six passages that condemn our gay, lesbian, bisexual, and uh, transgender brothers and sisters. I just think it's a shame, and I think it, it reveals. I think it reveals much. Some people, I think, are have just been taught this way that they're running a program in their head, but some people know better, and it's really a shame. A, a lot of the things that I think people, as we've worked with a lot of uh, parents, Christian parents who come out of the Southern Baptist and the conservative evangelical church, one of the things that has that has helped open their eyes is the fruit, the result of this message coming from the church. Is it drawing people to Jesus or is it driving them away? And when you say that, you know, 25% of all LGBTQ homeless youth became homeless the same day they came out to Christian parents. When, when you talk about 40% of all, of all homeless youth are gay, when you talk about 70% attempt suicide, these numbers are bringing people up short. And then what happens in their lives is they, they have their child comes out or a loved one comes out, and then they're playing with real money, life savings, unlike a lot of people who are in this debate who use the inerrancy of Scripture as an argument, are really playing with monopoly money. Why do you think it's so important for these people to see the Bible as literal and to view it as inerrant? You know, I think two things. One, I think we've been well-trained to believe that. And I think we've been well-trained and motivated by fear to believe that. And I think people like certainty. I mean, especially if you're a guy, just tell me what to do to, to be right with God. Give me the list of 10 things, you know, and, and let me do them and then don't bother me, you know. <laughs> but I, I think people like certainty. But it's, again, <laughs> the hypocrisy of how it's applied in some areas and how it's not applied in the other areas doesn't provide any certainty at all. So I don't quite understand that. But I do believe that people like certainty in their lives. So to think that, yes, I can read this and it is absolutely every word I read is true and it's literal gives people some comfort. Although I think that the patriarchal church can really undo that comfort by keeping people in fear and by supporting this kind of misuse or or abuse of scripture in this way. I do find it interesting when people want to say the Bible is inerrant, but I think it's almost more, well, the the verses of the Bible I've chosen to read, my cherry-picked version of the Bible is inerrant. So I can look in Deuteronomy and say, no eunuchs are going into the kingdom of God. But then when I look at the New Testament, the Christian scriptures, And I see, well, the very first Gentile convert to Christianity was an Ethiopian eunuch. Right. So I ask you, Brian, which passage is inerrant? I don't know. That's a good question, right? Exactly. Exactly. You know, for me, I mean, I'm I'm not a theologian. My wife, Susan, is is the theologian. Uh, So I tend to see things very, very simply, which I like that about me. (laughs) But, But to me, the most poignant argument on this issue is that, Let's just stop for a minute. Let's just set aside the, the, the commentaries and the theology debate for a minute. And let's talk about that there are hundreds of translations of the Bible. The oldest version of the Bible that we have in existence 
has 14,800 differences from the King James Version. My first question to anybody that says to me, well, the Bible is is clear. God God said what he said, and the Bible is, is inerrant. My first question back is, which Bible? Which one? I've been reading the Bible through, and I also have the commentary up beside it. And you see in the commentary, they take a particular Hebrew word and say, well, the, this version has this word, that version has that word, that version has that word. I think this is the right one, but obviously different interpreters right. of the Bible translators had a different view and then different tenses. Yeah, it makes a big difference. Most people have heard that the power of a comma where, you know, it's time to eat comma grandma or it's time to eat grandma. And so if a comma has that much power, how about certainly the tense of a word and, and has inc- incredible power. If you look at the word homosexuals was not didn't appear in the Bible until 1946. So which Bible was literally inerrant, the one in 1945 or the one in 1946? Right. And when we look at how the Bible came down to us, where it was an oral tradition, then at some point it was put into writing in Hebrew. And at that point in time, written Hebrew did not have vowels. You only wrote consonants. There was no capitalization, no punctuation. And you just had consonants just written without really any spacing and things so it's <laughs> imagine right. taking something in english that way so it's compounded way worse where it was only later that people decided well let's put in dot marks and indicate the vowels but those were based on the oral traditions yeah i mean imagine if something was written in uh, in the united kingdom 50 years ago we can barely translate that to understand it <laughs> you know what if we saw the word fag used in the United Kingdom. Cigarettes. Exactly right. Should we take that literally here? So, my gosh, I try to do this with all the grace and patience that's in me, which at times is not much, I admit. But but it's like, my gosh, people, please. I mean, I if you're going to be inerrant about something, if you're going to be literal about something, why not the passages about love? Why not the passages about acceptance? Why not the passage about mercy and about justice? And be inerrant and literal about that. Why are the only passages that seem to be brought up when this when this issue comes up are the passages that are used to other somebody or oppress somebody or condemn someone or justify the mistreatment of, a, of an entire group of people? It doesn't make any sense. I think about it maybe in, in the way of each of us bringing our own background, our own colored lenses to reading the Bible And some people want to read it through the lens of, I only see the sexual purity verses, and those are the ones that are most critical to me. You have a very different view of how you think the Bible says we ought to read it. Yeah, I think that I remember when, not that I was there, but when when Jesus was approached by the religious leaders about a theological issue, he never debated and he never answered them directly. He said something that brought the entire issue down to the heart of the matter and revealed their motives behind asking. I think it's critical, absolutely critical, that as we read scripture, we do so through the lens of love. You know, Augustine taught that if our interpretation of of scripture leads us to to condemn or judge or to withhold love from someone or or to oppress someone like that, then our interpretation is wrong. As we read scripture, again, you can proof text and you can cherry pick. You can you can find scripture as has been said over and over again. You can find scripture to to condemn or endorse just about anything. How do we move forward? And I think we have to move forward in in a way that we read scripture, we interact with scripture. And if it leaves us with a stronger desire and a stronger call to love and to care for and to help those who are oppressed and marginalized, then we're reading it the right way. If it leaves us with the feeling that, yes, I'm justified in having that person not serve on the worship team. Yes, I'm justified in kicking my child out of the house. Yes, I'm justified in 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 uh, in condemning and judging my brother, we're not reading it the right way. We're missing the very heart of God. So I think to always read scripture through the lens of love is something we need to remember. And I might add to that humility as, an, as a critical factor, a lens through which we ought to read scripture. If we 
Think about Jesus wandering in the wilderness for 40 days when he was tempted by Satan. Satan had all the scriptures at the ready to use to try and make, to try and puff up Christ and say, well, look, you've got all this power. You should do this. You should be proud. You should do all these things. And Jesus was there to temper that and say, well, here's, here's a different verse. And we, and we have this example of a battle between Satan and Jesus over scripture, each using scripture, but whereas Satan used it as a weapon, Christ Mm. used it as a balm, as a salve. And I think if we look at the scripture through the eyes of Christ, to your examples, every time a Pharisee, the legalist, the Sadducees brought him a case of, what about this law? How do you go with that? He always looked past it to how do we do what's best for people, for animals, for each other. It was all about the law being there to help us, but not to shackle us. That's a great point, Brian. Great point. So what do you think the takeaway is here for Robert? I'm sorry. What, what do you think, Robert? This is a, a common problem. <laughs> Robert, <laughs> what do you think? What do you That's think great. the takeaway is here for people who are talking to others about inerrancy or for those folks who maybe want to broaden their view of the Bible and look at things a little differently? Well, there's are two different questions. Let me take the, the second one first. The, as far as if you're wanting to broaden, I encourage everyone to really broaden your view of the Bible. Read, read different commentaries, especially commentaries that are different from, from uh, uh, your own view currently. I will certainly give you a broader understanding of Scripture and probably a... Um, a broader understanding and even empathy for those who disagree. On your first question, f- as far as how to interact with people who are arguing this point, uh, maybe don't. <laughs> <laughs> That's good advice, though. Yeah, we have to remember that, you know, don't waste your time debating with people who are committed to misunderstanding you. It can be toxic. Uh, I always try to quickly find out if I can discover the motivations of someone talking to me. So if they want to talk about, well, the Bible condemns homosexuality, and then we start talking about Sodom, and and then I pull up Ezekiel 1649. If their response is like, well, okay, what about Romans? Then I know, all right, well, you're not interested in really hearing anything. I even say read the passage right before that, because that's where the angels and God came down and were, you know, meeting with Abraham. Yes. And Abraham went out of his way to show them hospitality. And then you contrast that to what happened in Sodom. Right. Exactly. And I I try to discover what someone's motive is. And sometimes I try to find that Jesus-like response, which, again, I'm not. So that's rare. (laughs) But, again, that question like, well, which Bible? What do you mean, which Bible? Well, is it the NIV? Is it the New King James? Is it the original King James? Is it the old ones before that? Are, are we including the books from the Catholic Bible or not? But there can be dumbfounded on this. I don't get into this inerrancy, but if I sense that someone really is trying to understand, then I'll certainly go down the road with them and give them a lot of resources and and hopefully a lot of things to think about. But a lot of people just use this as as a point to make. And then in the end, sometimes I'll say, well, you know what? I, I understand I understand what you're saying. I used to believe a lot of what you believe. Um, you know, we've been in the church for more than 25 years. And, and um, you know, we, I understand. Um, I want you to know that I, that I, I read my scripture and uh, I pray and I follow the, and I follow the Holy Spirit in the leading. And, and I just want you to know that I'm fully affirming because of scripture, because of Jesus, because of my faith, not in spite of it. I think that's such an important point because so many of us are limited in our understanding of God by what we have been taught, by the way that stories from the Bible have been cherry picked into and even edited in that way so that they're presented to us. Yeah. And I think we really miss out on the the glorious fullness and wholeness of God by limiting ourselves to just a few verses here and there. Absolutely. I mean, I, I, I say a lot that my, you know, the greatest thing in my faith journey that ever happened to me was having a, having a gay daughter. And actually we have two daughters that identify as queer. God became much bigger 
my compassion became much richer and deeper. My faith became much richer and deeper simply because my eyes were opened. So I do say that also to people sometimes, which is not often received well. There's a freedom and joy and life and relationship with God out here more glorious than you can ever imagine. Just open your box a little. God's big enough. God's not God's not worried. God's big enough. Go ahead and press into Jesus on this and see what happens. I think to just debate with someone back and forth is probably not the best idea. So I try to leave them with with a couple things to think about. And then I, I try to give them something to aspire to, even if they brush it off right away. They they heard a Christian guy who has been where they are. They heard a Christian guy say that he's affirming because of his faith, not in spite of it. Sometimes they're just left with that. And that's sometimes that's enough. Great. Hey, thank you so much, Robert, for being with me again today and talking through this thorny issue. I know it's something that we deal with a lot and it's not my favorite topic to discuss, but I thanks for taking the time and going through it with me. As always, my pleasure, Brian. You enjoy. Thanks for listening to Be The Bridge. If you enjoyed the show, I'd love a positive rating and review on iTunes. I appreciate your support and feedback. For more details, visit brianpaytonjoiner.com or follow me on Facebook or Twitter. The links are in the show notes. Have a great week. And as my grandpa used to say, if you live life by your own rules, you're going to be okay.